We all know that real estate has created more millionaires than any other industry on the planet. We also know that it has created a lot of heartache due to mismanagement, overborrowing, and just simple life events that happen to all of us. Welcome to the Cash Flow Pro Podcast. My name is Casey Brown, and I am your fearless leader. And although we might be bourbon sipping and at times foul mouth Southerners, we will always do our best to be honest, straightforward, and due diligent with all of the information we pass along to you. Welcome to the show. Hey there, and welcome to today's episode of Cash Flow Pro, your daily real estate investing podcast and YouTube channel. I'm here today with Mike Angelo of NK Development Group, and he is in, what'd you say, Phoenix? Is that what you're telling me? Phoenix, yes, sir. Phoenix, awesome. Yeah, I think everybody lives in Phoenix, right? Except for me. I don't live in Phoenix. I wish I did, but uh, <laughs> no, Phoenix is a beautiful place. Um, and we are going to be talking today about the biggest mistakes that beginners make when investing in real estate. Sorry, I had to make sure I read that. It was awful long, but the biggest mistakes that beginners make when investing in real estate. And we're going to to kind of go back as, as Mike to there in the beginning or before I hit record was we uh, the mistakes they're all plentiful with all of us it's the ones that we learn from that uh, that make th that's the benefit of mistakes as long as we take a lesson from them that we don't necessarily repeat so anyway Mike welcome sir how are you today I'm doing fantastic Casey thank you so much for having me on the show super honored to be on it and uh, yeah looking forward to talking about uh, mistakes absolutely man and 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 again it's it's I've always said that well, I've always said I haven't always. Said, it's a, it's an old saying that I've heard that that once you admit the mistake and once you profess the mistake, that then uh, people tend. That's how people build. Like they build grace for you. They they're like, okay, hey, you know, he screwed up, but he's admitted it, he's fixed it, and we're going forward. And then and then you know you kind of get that get that feeling when when talking about mistakes. Anyway, so. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, what got you started in real estate, and then we will kind of tackle your first deal and the mistakes and things that went along with that, and we'll go from there. Absolutely, man. Again, thanks for having me. Sure. So I spent, uh, I've been in this business now for basically January 2020, so two and a half years, give or take, been a full-time real estate syndicator and in investment company. Uh, prior to that, I had about 20 years in the construction supply space, so if you think of large commercial projects from highways to office buildings to hospitals. Our company sold products to them. My role was in leadership, uh, so executive management for the last few years. But I was uh, all the way from the beginning days where I was the counter guy. You walked in and, and you bought stuff from to uh, executive VP at the end of my kind of 20-year career. And while I love working with contractors and learning that whole process, I figured out pretty quickly the higher I went up in the chain, uh, the more I worked. Uh, yes, I made more money, but I didn't have time to spend it with my family. And that was really physically and mentally draining me. So about the last six imagine. months of twenty, yeah, the last six months of twenty nineteen, I was like, I had to go, I had to go to a cardiologist because I was having chest pain and things like that. And he was like, man, yeah, I could put you on medicine or you know, tell me about your job. So I told him about what I did, and he said, you should get a new job. I said, <laughs> wow, that's that's pretty good advice, doc, right? And yeah. uh, and funny thing, like the writing was on the wall. Some changes were happening with our company and I actually got laid off in November of 19. And it was the best day. Actually, I, I got fired and I knew it was coming and I had uh, been listening to Dave Ramsey for many years. So we had, we had that emergency fund lined up and I uh, went home, told my wife and she was like, okay, what are you going to do now? I said, I have no idea, but I'm gonna take the month of December to figure it out. And on that six month journey, as I was trying to figure out the exit plan, I had been listening to tons of podcasts uh, on real estate and specifically multifamily. And it just completely blew me away that, you know, a guy like me with a few other people could go buy a large apartment building. You know, my, my real estate experience was uh, doing some flips in 2007 and eight. And if you remember 2007 and eight, it was probably the wrong time to do flips. And so uh, I got pretty crushed on that. And that was my real estate experience, to be honest with you. I made a ton of mistakes about that too. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's such a, I mean, you know, basically everything that you, you talk about there, um, because we seem to be the, the industry that cleans up the post W2 world, if you will. And I'm not sure that your last job was W2 necessarily, but, but we seem to be the, it's the industry that kind of picks up the people that are like, Hey, I just don't want to do what I'm doing anymore. I'm going to do real estate in some capacity. Right. Yeah. 
And so when you find out, so, so with all of that history and your back, your backstory there, why don't you tell us a little bit about, so 2020, obviously we all have a very memorable 2020, um, a lot of extra time spent with kids, a lot of extra time spent doing third grade homework, uh, and reading, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, possibly contemplating at least putting the kids up for adoption um in those three years not to not to to highlight that but it was tough so so let's go back to 2020 and let's talk about your first deal your first deal and i'd like to 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 first off kind of start with a where you found it and b what that looked like like where you found it what it looked like and, and how did you take it down and we're, so this is the deal we actually closed, right? I'm going to focus on that because yeah. there's thousands of other ones I didn't get. But uh, so the first deal we got, um, put an offer in, I think in like June or July of 2020. I uh, got it accepted in like August-ish, some negotiation. I found it randomly because we were, so based in Arizona, if the market here in Phoenix is, was so hot, I was just getting killed. Wasn't finding any deals. So I went to New Mexico and I was traveling there for my old life. So I was familiar with it. And Albuquerque was where we were really focused on. And there's a small city south of it called Las Cruces, New Mexico, about three hours south. Beautiful yep. little city. I know wasn't exactly really where Las Cruces is. Yeah. Wasn't really looking for that particular deal that I found on Crexy of all places. But I was looking for the broker because I wanted to call the broker and build a relationship with them. And I said, hey, man, this is what I'm doing. We're looking for you know, this size of the unit. It's about 50 plus. What do you have? And he's like, well, I have this deal. It's just getting ready to hit the market. Um, you know, take a look at it. So he sent me financials and I looked at it and I was like, yeah, it doesn't look like a bad deal. Uh, but I really wasn't genuinely that interested in it. I just wanted to get to know the guy and hopefully he had something better for me. And my education company that I signed up for said, get the pocket listings, get the off market stuff. And this was about to hit the market. So I was like, maybe it's not a good deal. Anyway, kind of parked it to be honest with you. I worked on a bunch of other stuff and those things didn't work out, came back to it said, Hey, we really are interested in this. Can we take it down? What, can, what do we, what do we need to do? Is it still viable? And negotiated and got it under contract didn't close until may of 21 so there was about a like almost a six month seven month gap between getting it kind of started to finishing and that was just because we we went and did something else for a while and, and then came back to it so that deal has been our flagship product a 60 unit complex uh, beautiful locations cash flowing really really well our, our first investors so we we did the whole thing we sourced it we raised the money uh, we did find a KP to help us sign on the note, but we did, you know, 90% of the work and it was, it was a fantastic deal. Transaction went really well. Everything else after that has been different and challenging. So we were a little sure. spoiled with that first one. Well, how much, how much was the raise? It was a uh, 1.8 million. So it was about a, wow. a four and a half million dollar path. Yeah. Yeah. 1.8. Man, that's big for your first one. Yes. Yes. Um, so we were friends and family and a couple of new investors that we, you know, we spent almost a year planting seeds and uh sure that sure. took a while but people don't always people want a track record right? they want to know that you've done this before so even though we had people that really liked us they weren't sure if they liked us enough to give us 50 or 100 grand and right. uh and so it took it took the kp to sign on the note his credibility his bio that we leaned heavy on and i said hey you know me from business experience i have 20 years of business experience real estate is different but we have a partner and this is his role and that helped kind of help again sell the the package, right? The investment. Sure. Now, where did you find the individual investors to even give the pitch to? Were they friends and family? Uh, all friends and family and referrals from friends and family. Yeah, I mean, we had my partner and I, Michael. We we focused on you know our kind of core fifty, which you know the fifty were like I'm in, and then when we went to go, hey, it's ready to go. It's like we had about twelve. We actually ended up having like sixteen investors total. So it was good. We had a couple of big ones, and then you know a couple of small ones, and that sure, helped us get across sure. the finish line. That's great, man. All right. So let's talk real quick about mistakes made along the way. Um, things that maybe didn't quite go as planned and what you did to mitigate those as they came up. Perfect. I want to speak of the mistakes I made prior to that, because that's okay. the deal we got done. We actually had three other deals that we had offers accepted on and where I'm, and I, and I spent my, I didn't have, I don't have enough, I didn't have enough capital at the time. I had zero experience. So all I did was underwrite. I underwrote deals. I tried to find them and I tried to find partners that would help me get the deal done, right? The GPs that would sign on the note. And I found one and I thought he was good and I didn't vet him enough and he bailed on me twice. So the mistake I made was not spending enough energy. I should have shifted my energy from underwriting to really securing who's going to be on our team that we're married to for five years. I definitely didn't do that. Um, 
and the only reason we we got into the the deal that we did close was I had to kind of reach out and found this operator that uh, is in our network, very vetted out network, but I, it took me a minute to go around and figure that out. Like he's the so guy. So the KP on the first one is who you're talking about bailed. Yeah. And then came first, back yeah, he, and then bailed. No, he, he bailed twice. He bailed twice on me and he was like, yeah, I'll do it. And he's basically, he's busy. He's like, I live in, I live in Chicago and I'll do whatever deals you want. And I was doing his work for him. And then, uh, he just was like, Hey, I got, I'm like, Hey, I got this offer accepted. And he's like, yeah, man, sorry. I can't, I can't do it. I'm like, Whoa. So I, all my eggs in that basket, right. Cause how am I going to sure. go move forward? So that happened to me twice. That was a big learning mistake. So I was like, Hey, let me, let me just forget everything else and focus on the team. And that was kind of the message here is focus on the team first. Make sure you can do that before you go out and go find deals. Cause here was the problem. Now I have to go to the broker and go, sorry, just kidding. Right. I, I can't, I can't pull through. So it, it worked out where our offer, I just didn't raise our offer enough. And so we lost, we were like in fourth place. Right. But you know, I'm putting this out there now. It was just, that was ridiculous. I, I, I can't believe I did that. Was super unprofessional, but I didn't know any better, you know? Yep. But you got to make mistakes to learn to know better. I mean, you know, it's, right. it's, 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 a, it's a learning curve. And unfortunately, sometimes it, 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 it costs us. And even if that cost is not monetary necessarily, it could be in pride or, or something of the, something of the sort, but um, all right. So, so vetting and focusing on the team. And I'll tell you what, I had a lady on my show recently and, and this, I, I have actually had actually heard this a long time ago and had heard it along the way. And she just solidified it. She's a, she was an attorney. She was a um, uh, immigration attorney, right? Also in business, but her big, her big passion was passive investing, right? So she was passive investor in these deals. And the question arose, I said, okay, what do you look for when you start to look at a deal to decide whether or not you're going to invest? And she said, I'm going to give you the worst answer ever. And I'm thinking, all right, well, worst answer ever. I've had those, but let's see what she's got. Right. And so the worst answer ever ended up being, she goes with her gut. Like she just, and, 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 and I've heard this before in masterminds that I'm in where you could stand up there and you could rattle IRRs, ARRs, cash on cash, uh, uh, every other figure or number or metric you want to present. But when it comes down to where the rubber meets the road, people want to know that they can trust you with their money, period, right? The return is almost secondary. Mm -hmm. it, and so true. I say all of that to kind of bring us back to what you're saying about focusing on the things that matter rather than you were focused on the numbers, the, uh, the IRRs, the ARRs, cash on cash, the underwriting, the, the, all that, while that is important and it's important to understand that in order to, to, to put together a business plan, you have to be focused on building that team too. I mean, you have to be focused on building that trust and that trust comes through you and your team and everybody else that, that you kind of put together there. And so that's interesting. Now, so you go out and you find a KP. Where did you find him at? Now, KP, let me back up. KP, key principal, key partner, whatever you want to call it, um, is basically the, the the loan signer, the person that takes his balance sheet to the bank and says, hey, I'm worth this. Loan us this. Yep, so, exactly. Uh, very blessed to be. I, I, so I did sign up for an education company um, that uh, teaches you this kind of stuff, right? Multifamily. And mm -hmm. so spent the first few months working with them and that was part of their pitch is, Hey, come in, we'll help you find a sponsor. We'll do all this stuff. And most of that is fairly nonsense because their deal criteria <laughs> that they want is like impossible to find. And so, but that person was in that network. And so through my partner who had a relationship with them, he said, Hey, we have this deal the sponsor kind of fell through, you know, would you be available? So spent time with him, got to know him and he said, yeah, this, this looks solid. I'll, uh, you know, I'll support you guys. And so he partnered with us and, uh, you know, signed on the note. We all signed on the note, but ours didn't mean as much as his. And, right. uh, and so that, that's what got us the deal done. And without that network connection, it wouldn't have happened. Right. Um, sure. So yeah, that was a key piece. And how, how many other partners was there? A uh, total of three. So myself, this gentleman and my, and my partner. Okay. So gotcha. it was a total of three. Yeah. Gotcha. And so it's funny that all of this is kind of happening out of the spotlight of the market, you know, off market deal, um, you get kicked 
down first and you stand back up, then you get kicked down again, then you stand back up and then you're like, all right. And then finally, I guess, I guess the universe was just like, all right, we're going to let Mike have a pass and and he's going to take this deal down. And, and, and then what uh, of all of those mistakes that, that were made, um, highlight the most valuable lesson you learned after, you know, you said you focused on the team, but there had to be some other lessons that came along there. There's a, t- I mean, yeah, there's uh, a litany of mistakes that but are just lessons learned. Right. So yeah, definitely team being one. Uh, I think we were fairly blessed that I, I do have s- some OCD skills or being organized to make sure all the steps are in place. So we had a portal, we had investors. So all that went relatively smooth. Uh, the one thing we couldn't control is all the lender components, right? We didn't really know what the lender was asking for and, and setting good expectations. So the, everyone is, you know, trying to satisfy a property management company. They're looking for takeover. There's the first deal was so great from all the things that came at us. And as I try to digest it back, I think setting good investor expectations of, you know, Hey, if you get a hundred people to tell you they're in, the reality is probably 20 or less are going to actually commit. That's so right. when we went out and raised, I'm like, Hey, I have, I can go raise $5 million today. That was, the, I, that literally came out of my mouth. Right. And I think out of the 1.8, I, I raised about 800 ish uh, of that. So my partner raised the balance. And so that's a pretty far gap from 5 million. Right. And that's because sure. I didn't know better. Right? I didn't know that, you know, just cause they, they say yes, that by the times to send the, the wire in that they're not actually going to do it. So it's just one of those things, you know, and it could yeah. be them not trusting you, not knowing you, just not really genuinely ready, although that's what they'll tell you, right? Yep. Um, so, and some people are standing, and what was, what was really cool out of that, deal number two came, and I had people calling me that said no the first time. They're like, hey, when's your next deal? Yep. I was like, it's coming now. So it was funny how that see. happens. Like, everybody's like, yeah. oh, wait a minute. This guy does know what he's doing. Oh, I want he in. actually got it I'm done. In. Yeah, he, he actually got it done, right? Yeah, so, and, um, and showing that grit. And the grit that it takes to get stuff like that done, man, that's, that's what's so impressive about a lot of these deals, especially when I'm, when I'm on these podcasts talking to people about their first deal, because it it tends to be a reflection of like, maybe looking back and saying, Hey, yeah, that was like the springboard, you know, that, that really got things going. So now with that, let's kind of transition into the second deal just to see what lessons carried over and what, what did you do to, did you have a way to, um, kind of streamline after that a little bit we wanted to go bigger is what we did know um so we we started looking at 100 plus 150 plus unit type products uh projects and so then it was like well then we have to grow our team and who can we do that with that we like and trust ourselves and so that worked out really well again within the same network that i had mentioned the education network we we found another a couple that had been doing these kinds of deals and they liked us they kind of went through some underwriting courses with us as I was looking at deals. And so I found a pre-market deal that was in San Antonio, 200 units. Um, we started that in November. Tra- the transaction started in November, right before Thanksgiving and uh, got under contract there. And that was, I could, that was the exact opposite of it going smooth. It went almost the other way. It was a heavy lift. We're still working on the asset manager for it right now. And um, the, the best thing we did was find the right team. To get them to buy in on what we were doing this was almost a six million dollar raise a 18 million dollar purchase and uh so a big leap and what are the things that change really is just having a bigger team to know who's going to do what and you know coming from the raise side there's a ton of stuff to do there the loan was really challenging because it was an underperforming asset so we were blessed to have one of the gentlemen that signed for us he's actually a loan broker so i mean you talk about an inside track that was pretty awesome to go. Sure, yeah, yeah, and that's definitely a, a a shot in the arm for sure. I mean, to 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 definitely to keep things at least moving forward. You know, the loan. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome. So, all right, and where was that? Where was that second asset located? You said San Antonio, Texas. Man, I, San Antonio has been really hot here lately. Especially, I mean, as of recording, the end of August here. Man, it's been a solid market. And what did was that like 2020 as well? Did you do did you get two done in the same year? No, that was that was uh 21 is when we closed our first deal, May 21. Oh, okay. And then November of 21 we started the deal. We didn't close until April of this year, so that was 5 months of uh, of negotiating, going back and forth on trying to get it all done, but 
Yeah, sure. so it's a that long five months after you had already submitted an LOI, and then of course you go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth as due diligence items come up, as things tend to 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 just the natural progression of things. I guess did you end up just negotiating other things in or down or whatever? It was negotiating. It was delays. We had issues with uh, insurance and even just getting debt. So we we ended up having to do a couple different extensions to get it done, but we got it all done. And uh, but it, man, it was it was really painful. I think a lot of sleepless nights on that one because we had we had a ton of money go hard. Um, you, you know, when you deal with bigger transactions in bigger cities, this is not like hey, you got a thirty day window to just free free play. But this was hey, this two hundred thousand dollars hard. And then we did a bunch of those. So by the time we closed, we were almost nine hundred thousand dollars in. But, man. Yeah. Um, and and again, from my standpoint, I'm the guy that found the deal and I'm doing the asset managing. I'm relying on our team to help us execute this. So I, I did have money in it, but not anywhere near that amount. So a lot of people had a lot of trust in now, us. And I'd like for you real quick to explain what going the money going hard is yeah. and what that means. Absolutely. So um, when you buy, when you go under contract, you have an earnest money deposit. So usually it's a percentage of the purchase price. One to 2% is typically what you see. 2% is kind of common today. Um, in the old days or prior to probably COVID, you would see, hey, I'm putting in a refundable deposit. So let's say it's a $5 million purchase. You're going to put in $100,000, right? 2%. That's going to sit in escrow. And that gives the buyer... Um, you know, the willingness commitment, it gives the seller some confidence that this guy's going to come in, but usually yep. you have 30 days or so, or sometimes even more that that money comes back to you. If you decide it's not going to be good or the deal doesn't work for some reason. So what had happened with all of the pressure on multifamily specifically is things were going hard on day one and hard means it's non-refundable day one. So you put that money in sight unseen. And if you want to walk away on day two, because the building is falling apart, your money goes away. Gone gone and and none of us operate that way and we didn't do any deals like that that deal what we started to do was a seven day early access so that was our way around hey we have a purchase and sale agreement but we have a seven day access period that's a free look the money we put in a, ref, a refundable component after seven days that refundable component becomes non-refundable so it was just a quick way to hey in the first six days we'll know if we're going to buy this thing scope yep. the lines check the roofs i mean nothing catastrophic ideally right yep um so that was our way around it. But in Phoenix, man, I couldn't, I could not play. We're talking about a quarter million dollars hard on day one. Oh and yeah. So I was 100%. like, I'm going to, I'm going to go to a different sandbox. I'm just, I can't play here. Yeah. I've got uh, some friends in the Phoenix market, man. And they're, they're, yeah. they've become incredibly s strong in the last, what is this? A year and a half, two years. Mm -hmm. My buddy over there, he's, he's knocking it out of the park and he's, yeah. he's really good at it. He says, and he's strictly in that market, you know, but he knows it he can raise the money and he can keep things moving in the right direction. I bet you I know who you're talking about, but yeah, it's a, <laughs> a couple of great guys there and just doing really good work. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're, they're knocking it out. I, I'm, I'm certainly impressed. And, um, uh, but so when you start talking about, I want to, I want to, as we, as you've talked and as the progression as as we've moved through your deals here i want to go back because i feel like it's it's worth at least spending a little bit more time talking about the team and what you look for in people like cuz i want to go outside of just the kp and and so so what because there had to be some some potential you you had said that one guy flaked out on you uh twice and whatnot um but what what do you look for when you start putting together the team? First of all, what team members did you need or what, what did you call them? And then what did you look for in each one? Sure. Um, so I start with core values. You know, one, is there alignment? Is there some energy when we speak? And then how are we tackling whatever it is that we're going to try to get after? So, mm -hmm. Hi, this is Casey Brown, host of the Cashflow Pro podcast and YouTube channel. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate but just don't know where to begin? I'd like to help by inviting you to check out our website at www.3000capital.com. There you will find an array of material that will help you learn all about real estate syndication. And while you're there, be sure to check out our free video series download titled Five Must Know Keys to Success in Passive Real Estate Investing. I'd also like to personally thank you for making Cashflow Pro part of your day. Now, back to the show. You know, my partner was the first guy I started working with and didn't know him from anything. I think we connected on Facebook and then we met in person, walked with him, talked with him. And we had similar values. We looked at the same kind of approach. We're looking at long-term growth, 
you know, you can make a lot of money really fast in real estate or you can lose a lot of money or sure. you can become wealthy over a long period of time. So we, we kind of have that same vision of, hey, this is a long-term play. And we're going to do it right. Yep. Um, so core value is key. And then what is their role? So my partner's role originally was, hey, capital source. We're going to need some, you know, uh, hard, not hard money. We're going to need some, some uh, funds for doing these transactions. I'm going to source the deal. And then we need a, a key principal to help us sign on the note and guarantor. So those kind of together, that was our role to the original role. And then as we started to grow, especially the San Antonio deal, it's like, wow, this is a heavy lift. I don't have any experience in this. Um, our partner that had done a bunch of these deals, he's like, hey, we should bring somebody else in because we don't know what we don't know. And so right. the group, the couple we brought in also met the criteria on all on all fronts, but they had had done a very heavy lift in that same market just a few years prior. So it was a fantastic kind of fit. And we already, they already checked the boxes on the other side. So it was easy to vet that. Um, I think anyone starting off, you know, sometimes the easiest thing to do is you partner with the guy sitting next to you or the girl sitting next to you in your class. And I don't think that's always the best idea. It's the easiest, but it's not the best. And, and I think nine times out of 10, there's, it, it gets dissolved at some point, but you got to figure out who, what your strengths are. So my strength is finding the deal, analyzing it, putting the business plan together. Uh, and I, I do raise money. So I have, I have a good investor capital base, but um, sure. my other partners, that's all he does focus on. I don't worry about underwriting, make sure, make sure you can articulate it to your investors, but you focus on finding money. Um, you know, and then I have a third person that kind of finds the debt, right? Figure out the debt piece. Yeah. So, that's what you said. You, the, the loan, the loan originator, the loan, uh, the loan guy that came along with you. That's awesome, man. So, so how many doors are you all up to right now? Uh, four fifty-three, four hundred fifty-three doors. So about six properties and we have two development deals. So we own dirt at this yeah. point and, uh, Shoot, we're going to yeah. build, uh, yeah, some apartments here in Phoenix, Casa Grande's a little South of Phoenix. Uh, we have a single family development project that we bought, uh, the land for, and then I actually have a totally different project. It's a redevelopment project. It's in a, again, downtown area that, it's an office building. It's vacant. We're going to redevelop it into a restaurant, retail, brewery. Um, it was just a really good find. And I just said, hey, if we can figure out how to, to make money, help our investors get a good return and have a fun project, why, why not? It's not really work. It's just, it's, it could be cool. Sure. Yeah, so. that's right. And then, and then you know, and I, but I tell you what, man, a lot of that, you know, like, for, take Louisville, Kentucky, for example. There, There's there's like, like we were up there, well, it was back during the Derby weekend. And, um, man, like the, a, a side of town that had run down, ragged, falling over gas stations, they had turned it into a microbrewery and, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's so, it's so interesting how some of that stuff and some of that, some of that reclassification stuff has taken place. And I might've been to that man in Louisville, right? I, we walked down to a place that was an old gas station. It was a super cool, they had a little outdoor area and, uh, yeah, yeah was, like a was, super last year cool I was vibe. Down there. I mean, it was, yeah. Yeah, and then they, they had the. I, I think, as a matter of fact, I think they had. I can't remember. I think they had the old glass. The glass door came up like a the garage door. They had replaced it with a see through glass door, and it. But anyway, yeah, the rolling so, door. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We might have been. Yeah, man, place. that's yeah. small world, dude. Small world for sure. So <laughs> everybody yep. comes yep. to Kentucky for some reason or another. I guess. Well, we it's went for bourbon, weird. so you know. <laughs> Yeah, I got you. Well, all right. Well, listen, well, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Now, I've got a couple of questions we ask every guest that comes on the show. And the first of those questions is, what is the best book that you've recently read or are currently reading? Um, so I've, I've finally I've really gotten into reading a lot. And I just put this on another one. So there's a book called Juggling Elephants. Um, oh, that's cool. Okay. Yeah, Jones Laughlin. So I, my old boss made me read this. So I, it's probably been five, six years since I've read it. I just reread it. But it, it has a lot to do with the metaphor is, you know, juggling elephants is pretty difficult, right? And yeah. so trying to prioritize things. And uh, there's a big focus on family in that. And a lot of us that get into this, we just forget about our kids and our spouses. And um, we did. that one really helped me recenter and focus on what's really, why am I doing this? You know, yep. it was really important. So, so that was, that's my, that's my, my read. That's awesome, man. My, as uh, uh, my mother used to say, the only way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time, you know, so it's kind of the there same. You go. Keep it going. So, all right. What is a dream vacation that you have taken or hope to take? Um, we are going to go to Jamaica here shortly. Um, I, we, anything, anything on the beach or coastal, but I think our dream one is Tahiti. So oh, I want to wow, go, yeah. I want to, I want to stay on top of one of those bungalows with the, yep. with the ocean below me. So that's, that's on our list. 
I think that's on, I think that to some degree is on everybody's bucket list. I think it just depends on how far down it is really. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, awesome. pretty soon here. Well, well, cool, man. Well, listen, if the listeners heard something that, that they, that resonated with them or they want to learn more about uh, maybe you all, uh, what is a good way for them to reach out and get in touch with you? Check out our website. So we just rebranded as Nimble Capital Group. So NK is our, our development arm, but Nimble Capital Group, www Nimble Capital Group. Check it out. Um, there's a ton of education there. My contact information is there. Happy to check that out. I'm on LinkedIn, Mike Angelo, and uh, yeah, reach out anytime. I'd love to. I always challenge people. I, I heard a, a guy on a podcast he said nobody ever calls me. I give him my number. I call that guy. And so if you guys want to call me, you're welcome to call me. My number's on our website. Awesome. There you go, man. Hey, that's the way to do it. You got to tell you, you got to be assertive and take assertive action. So awesome. Mike, thank you so much for your time, man. We, we, I can't really thank you enough. And, and, you know, again, the, mis- the, 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 the biggest mistakes that beginners make when uh, investing in real estate, I keep having to go back and read that it's too long. Uh, but, you know, I think a lot of people can take what we've told them and learn. And if nothing else, maybe they can put a little notch in their, in their, in their little feather in their hat and, and take what we, what we've talked about here and move forward. So, Awesome. Well, thanks again. And listeners, as always, please head down and smash that subscribe button so that you can be notified when we release new episodes and new content. And again, uh, Mike gave you his website. So go check that out. Give the man a call. Please call him. Nobody ever calls him. Uh, he said some other guy said never call him. Well, call this man. Call this man. Talk to him. He'd be glad to help you and show you how you can make investment. And and man, I gotta I gotta give you props on that Las Cruces deal. Las Cruces is a is a very is a very neat area I, I think it's it's very i love how how heavy the culture is there it's 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 mm-hmm. just it's a different kind of place so for sure, um, for sure well awesome man well thank you all so much and listeners and mike as well i hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the day thanks casey appreciate it cash flow pro is hosted by casey brown founder and ceo of 3000 capital a commercial real estate investment firm committed to providing its investors with ongoing cash flow and helping them build long-term wealth If you enjoyed today's podcast, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you'll be notified about all our future episodes. You can find more information about us and our investment philosophy by clicking the link in the show notes below. Thanks for listening.